for 61. Wow. I'm Smiley Kaufman, and this is The Smiley Show. Welcome back to another episode of The Smiley Show, and uh, I'm laughing here. I hope you're watching on YouTube or Sports Grid TV, because Smiley just cheers us with uh, some sort of ornate-looking drink. Smiley's in the Virgin Atlantic Lounge in San Francisco Airport, so some some Delta family uh, of airports, as he is en route overseas to the United Kingdom for the Open Championship, fresh off a week in Tahoe. Yeah, uh, got a little margarita. It's actually fantastic. Uh, when it came out, you know, I'm used to the big jumbo margaritas that you get in the uh, Mexican restaurants, but this is like a high-end one with the salt on the side. Uh, yeah, it's really good uh and after that drive about three and a half hours from tahoe uh Ooh. to here by the way san francisco is so beautiful uh driving in seeing the golden gate bridge also seeing Al- alcatraz which is where i play a lot of Warzone. i know every inch of that map so <laughs> it's, it was cool yes. to wave that as i uh drove past but yeah beautiful city it, it is. It's funny. I, and growing up in Fresno, that's about as far north as I ever traveled. We were talking. You're on the way in, passing Sacramento, and it's like that's a part of the state that I never ever really went to. As far as I was concerned, San Francisco was the top of the state of California <laughs> when I was living there. But it was. Uh, it's funny because everyone, everyone always like looks at the Golden Gate Bridge, and that's like the iconic thing. And that was another bridge. Like if you were coming from the south, you just you would never ever go on that bridge. You just take a different, so you just kind of look at it from the distance. <laughs> anyway, this is this is a this is a very random tangent we're on now. San Francisco landmarks, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm also short on sleep. Uh, given my own airline issues I've had for the last couple of days, <laughs> flying on. You're on a jet, tough run, really tough run. Jet blew it. I'm calling it Jet blew it from now on. It's now on the no fly list. Uh, we're not we're not doing that ever ever again. Uh, American so. Airlines, Jet blew it, both on the. Uh, both on the list, right? As of now, both on the 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 Charlie Hume do not fly list. Uh, I, I gotta, I need to make a call to JetBlue uh, to request. They they gave me a hundred and fifty dollar travel voucher, and I'm gonna try to negotiate a little bit and say I want that in cash because I never want to fly your airline again. You need to do the same <laughs> with American as well. We're gonna stick to Delta. You're a big Delta guy. I'm gonna try to kind of follow in your footsteps. Uh, we have big some Delta travel. Guy. Big Delta we're, guy. We're 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 looking at some travel upcoming for some projects, and I, I'm I'm either gonna do Delta or I'm gonna just rent a van. Because uh, <laughs> dude, unfortunately, not, like Raleigh's like a big like it's more American Airlines than it is Delta, right? Big American Airlines hub, uh, mm. which is is problematic unless I want to drive to Charlotte, I guess, uh, or do so. You know what? Southwest really they do a pretty good job for the where they sit in the airline food chain. So I think I'm, I'm going to do a little Southwest American or Southwest Delta rather combo. Okay. I'm here for that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, that's, that's neither here nor there. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's, let's dig into the meat of this episode a little bit. I, well, really where we should start is what you were just doing, which was uh, at the American century championship out in, uh, <laughs> I did a lot of that. That margarita lasted like seven seconds, by the way. That's, uh, uh, that's, that's, it looked phenomenal. I'm sure you did. Yeah. A lot of that stuff out at Edgewood. And I, I just, what I know about this was, uh, while I was traveling, uh, ending this sort of this run I've been on, I was getting texts from your dad, AKA the squirrel man. Uh, I got a video of you catching a pass from, from Josh Allen, which is amazing. Heard some rumors. You were shooting hoops with the Curry family. Also amazing. Uh, and, uh, your dad, Jeff got a shout out from Charles Barkley. So how about that for the week out there? Well, uh, explain a little bit more about <laughs> it's this a big, and- week, big week for Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Jeff got some shout outs and, uh, from Charles. Yeah, dude, the, the week, I mean, Tahoe lived, lived up to it, man. I mean, just, they had such a great list of athletes, celebrities, um, you know, all these people that. I've always been fans of that. I just had, you know, an opportunity to spend a lot of time with, uh, and there was karaoke one night. There was another mm. party the night before at a kind of a concert venue. Then there was a concert that we went to. So every single night you had an opportunity to socialize with, you know, all these famous people. So for me, did, it was, did we get drops of Jupiter? Did we get a little drops of Jupiter? <laughs> so the karaoke night, I, 
I, I joked that I was going to sing Drops of Jupiter, which is my karaoke go-to song. I, I would say chickened out. I just wanted to feel it out year one, seeing like, is it just a celebrity <laughs> thing or are other people doing it too? You know, I think now that I know oh, a majority of the people, if I got up there, everybody would be like, oh, it's that guy. It's the guy from the 17th hole uh, <laughs> that won't shut up and stop interviewing me. So it's that guy. <laughs> but Drops of Jupiter or uh, that was going to be the song or – it's a great day to be alive, Travis Tritt. That one always seems to get the okay. people going too. But to, uh, I mean, just the just the golf tournament was. I mean, I I think I drove around at one time. So if you told me like, oh, what do you think of the seventh hole? I'd be like, I have no idea. I was on the seventeenth hole on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and had the best view of just so many fans that were there out out there trying to get whether it was an autograph or just a picture of some of the world's famous athletes and celebrities. And I had the best seat in the house. So the week was pretty dang cool. Uh, the Kelsey brothers, I feel like kind of stole the show. The MVP though, for me, probably Blake Griffin. I told him this on air. Oh, okay. This guy is just an electric factory, absolute electric factory. Him and Chandler Parsons were kind of tied to the hip a little bit. They did mm. karaoke together and they were fantastic. I, I, th- I can't remember what song he sang, but it was something with I think a little bit of rap in it to where they both got lost in the karaoke, like with the lines of where they were in the song. Like they were telling the band they were wrong, but I think it was definitely them. (laughs) And and so those two guys uh, cracked me up, man. Um, But they just, their personality, Chandler's personality, Blake's as well. I guess give them co-MVPs because they, they were, uh, they were hilarious this weekend. That's amazing. It, it looked like it always looks like a ton of fun, but I, I tuned in a little bit to kind of just to see what, what, what you had going there on, on the 17th. And, and is it correct that I believe I saw Jason Kelsey uh, blade a wedge shot across the green and end up on. Was he playing a shot from the beach? Like, does it just does the 17 just drop off <laughs> yeah, into the beach next right, to Lake Tahoe? Yeah, it's like 10 feet of sand and right into Lake Tahoe. That has got to be one of the cooler like course features that exist. Like just you know, <laughs> it's make, great. Make make an ace and just I tell you, you what, know, strip it, down running the, the lake. It was great spectating. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all of the, it was just a the Lake Tahoe Navy of boats were out there every single day. The music was blaring. Just uh, one of the coolest things ever. And, and part of me was like, is this what live is like? <laughs> you know, just the music blaring. And hey, I loved it. It was a great. A uh, place to spectate. Uh, just you know, it, did I call it real golf? No, but it was it was a really cool atmosphere, and I loved it. And I'm, I was thinking, is this? But I like this every week. No, I wouldn't. But this was really cool. Yes, yes. That that is the interesting. You know, it's like it, it's in some ways. I feel like that's where to really go on a tangent. That's where we're at with Bryson, where it's like. You know, some of the charm is you just get them every once in a while, you know, and you get the, the music every once in a while and you're like, hey, <laughs> this is kind of fun. Kind of miss this. I can get used to this. But then you, you really you can't get used to it. That's kind of the charm of it, that it's every once in a while. Well, Smiley has successfully dined in the uh, the old Virgin Atlantic <laughs> Club. Just had a little dinner break here. Uh, so we're, we're good on that front. And just uh, ordered some uh, cookies as well. It's. Pistachio, dark chocolate, and Ooh. sea salt. I'm not sure if all three come or if, if she's just going to surprise me. So what we'll do we see. have for dinner, by the way? What was what was what was that little meal? Clubhouse we chicken burger. Uh, okay, I'll give it a six point two out of ten. But the mm. fries, that's what's going to hold me down for the fight. Yeah, that's playing it safe. That's like drafting a left guard. You know, <laughs> just going to kind of anchor the line. It's going to keep it. Going to keep the the team. You mm-hmm. know between the lines there so she said the salmon's great but the last mm. thing i want to do is order salmon and it just and then i just get hungry you know yeah light and also airport fish um <laughs> even even in san francisco airport fish not to be trusted so yeah so there yeah. you have it here we are well uh yeah it's enough about our uh let's see random random airport dining travels uh tahoe things of that nature let's get right into the the professional golf uh so to speak the scottish open where we had another thrilling storyline at a national open uh but the, another uh, the same winner robert mcintyre <laughs> again wins the national open the scottish open uh gets it done in front of the home crowd year after coming up you know just narrowly short with rory winning last year
anyone that's been to a sporting event, the atmosphere before a game, I think Game Time Decisions has that same exact atmosphere. This is our arena. This is what we do. There is going to be an energy to game time decisions that you will feel night in and night out. The excitement you get when you when you lock your bets and when you're figuring out what you want to do, we can zone in on the biggest games each night. I want this to be the place that people come to before the games start so they feel as ready as possible to lock in their cards. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. We're gonna go through every single thing and I've got a great team behind me that's gonna help me get the job done. There is not gonna be a better place, I promise you, than Game Time Decisions to get that new information, react to it, and be able to then bet accordingly. We will have everything at our disposal and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on SportsGrid. Will they both make it? Yes. But it has more to do with the fact of the three teams that are not really good at all in Dallas, Washington, and the Sparks, and an Atlanta Dream Team without Ryan Howard that's spiraling out of control. If they can get those two teams, Indiana and Chicago, that's going to be a major boom for ratings. Betting above the rim, only on Sports Grid. DeMar DeRozan now joins that team in Sacramento with the King. Aaron Fox, DeMontis Sabonis, Devin Carter, who they drafted early, Keegan Murray as well. A Kings team, DRS, that has been a playoff contender. Is it going to equate to a championship? Probably not. That's not the goal. Make your team better every offseason. The Kings definitely got better with that move here, Ben. The early line, only on Sports Grid. I got to put my hand up and say, I don't know how the, the data gut model did not catch this one. This should have been like big flags, big, big blue and white cross Scottish flags, uh, uh, you know, identifying Bobby Mack as, as, a, as a potential winner here because he uh, has talked about how he, he gets home. He's been homesick at times, loves being back at home. His other went on tour this year at the Canadian Open came with his dad in the bag. So this should have been an easy one to flag. My apologies. Uh, but you know, a, a, a it, I think maybe the place to start is kind of big picture on Robert McIntyre because he's projected a jump to number sixteen in the world. It's crazy, man. He's now won twice this this season on tour. There are only two other guys that have done that on tour. One was Rory McIlroy. One of those wins came partnered with with Shane Lowry, uh, and the other is Scotty Scheffler, of course. So it, it is difficult to win twice in a season on tour, and and that is pretty good company. Bobby Mack is in now, and. To just kind of extend on that point of just the homesickness and the betting in on PGA Tour and kind of, you know, trying to find your footing in a place that's maybe a bit uncomfortable, just making sense of, of his trajectory and where he's at. Because to me, this is a guy who's obviously he's been on a winning Ryder Cup side. Um, he, he feels like a guy that if he could make the UK his home base and play on a global tour, he'd absolutely dominate. Um, but I just, I, I personally have trouble kind of projecting out what the rest of his career looks like simply because it's like how comfortable will he be playing a full-time circuit in the United States of America where to this point he said it's not been comfortable for me you know it's interesting you say all that and, and I I will say it definitely was looking us right into the face we, I, I can't believe we didn't really even mention Robert heading into the Scottish Open a guy that had yeah. such a good chance to win last year plays you know he's playing home type of conditions so it's got to be comfortable to me likes the golf course obviously so uh, that was a misstep by our part because that was <laughs> i think it's easy to to sometimes think that guys are going to put too much pressure on themselves and you either say oh he's going to play well there because you know he's at home he should feel comfortable or it's the other way you never feel like the middle ground of that so i i either think like robert's missing the cut or he's you know going to win like he did this week but um uh, in Robert's career, too, um, as the margarita is getting delivered, uh, oh. <laughs> margarita number two. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Different glass this time. Yeah, I, I, I really could go for a margarita right about now. It's a big boy glass this time yeah. <laughs> compared to the other one. But it seems that Robert is is feast or famine a bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you when I've watched him play, it's definitely good. It's it's nothing great considering 
all the other players that I watch week in and week out. I, I think he does a lot of stuff, stuff really well, but it's nothing that just catches my eye, if that makes sense to you. Mm-hmm. So, and Dana Goff kind of shows that a little bit too, that he, you know, there's, there's nothing that just is like a huge strength in his game. He's just a player that when he's playing well, uh, he's able to take advantage of weeks in which everything feels really well. Uh, he's a guy that misses plenty of cuts, but he seems to take advantage of his good weeks better than most players, which I think, I don't know if that's more about playing weekends or more about once you just get to Saturday, it's like, okay, finally the the pressure's off of making the cut and, and is able to go out and play with some confidence. So you wouldn't have seen it coming into the week, you know, missing the cut of the rocket mortgage, uh, you know, missing the cut at the U S open, obviously one in Canada. So you just kind of felt like Canada was going to be his swan song this year. And you just, I felt like that was going to be, you know, his big moment in 2024. So him winning the Scottish open took me by surprise, obviously took you by surprise, but what an absolute scene on the 18th green. That was so cool to see. Oh my gosh. Yes. I mean, I think for a guy that, um, I mean, clearly cares so much about this place and, and this tournament, you know, I, th- I think it, it's, it's interesting that it, it, it that he won the Canadian Open this year and he had a similarly emotional response for very different reasons because his dad was there on the bag with him. But that same tournament the year before we got the Nick Taylor win, it was absolutely electric. And this very much felt like the same sort of thing of a guy that is just so thrilled to win this tournament in front of a home crowd and, and the real is an understatement, right? Oh my God. I mean, it's, it's what it, I think it's just one of those things. That it's why golf's so cool is that, you know, there are um, guys who could have won this, who would have been very happy to secure a PGA tour win, one that has a, maybe a little bit of a larger purse given the partnership with the DP world tour and one that leads into a major, but for a guy like Bobby Mack to win in front of the home crowd, just means so much more. And I, I think, and it's a great point you make too, about if you go back and you look at his results, I mean, I think he's missed nine cuts this year. That early stretch of the season was really rough. And I think maybe personally, when I'm kind of looking at these guys and trying to figure out if they're going to play good or not, maybe I, I place a little bit too much emphasis on a recent run of form. But that's why I say just I, I have trouble assessing a guy like this because it, it, the thing that should have been staring me in the face is he's he's he's, he's, he's kind of telling you when he's going to play good. It's like, I miss home. (laughs) If I have something that makes me comfortable, like my dad on the bag or being in Scotland, I'm probably going to play a lot better. And you know, here we go. (laughs) The two times that's happened, he's come home with trophies. So I think that's a credit. Give him credit, right? Like when he finds himself in contention, he knows how to win and he's, he's not scared of winning. He's, he kind of is able to just to go out and, and go full bore and just trust his game and knows that it's good enough to go out and win. And so when you see his name near the top of the leaderboard going into the weekend, you just have to think to yourself, don't overlook this guy. Without a doubt. Uh, I think the place to go next is the way in which he won, because it's been the subject of quite a bit of discussion online. Uh, So uh, Robert McIntyre finishes three, 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 and that is an Eagle, a par and a birdie uh, to win the tournament by a shot over Adam Scott. And I think, the place to start our discussion is the three he makes at 16, that Eagle. And so just to recap for those who did not watch it, uh, 16 is a 568 yard par five was, I think was playing the easiest on the course uh, on Sunday. And so Robert hits his drive 324 yards and in, in kind of misses the fairway, right? into some of that classic thick, long, which grass. is it's easy to do because if you miss it left, there's two pop bunkers that you just cannot go in. So it's, I think it's one of the harder drives on that golf course, but if you find a lie in the right fescue, if you find a lie, if you hit the fairway, it's not a complicated second shot. Yeah. He, and he ends up in a place where having just returned from Scotland, I'm not sure I could have gotten out of that lie with a chainsaw. I mean, it was buried deep in there. And so he gets over there and he and his caddy are kind of going through options. Looks like they're going to kind of try to chip out to the left and he's taking some practice swings and it looks like he's got a, a scythe in his hand because he's just taking huge chunks of grass and swaths of grass as he's kind of getting ready for this and, and sort of clearing some of that, that grass and, and then going to take a stance, he's realizing that he is standing on a sprinkler. And he's almost like the, the reaction is he's stunned. He, he said, I, I think he said something to the effect of it was great. The mics picked it up. Like, I'm not even fooling. I'm not even joking. Like, I, I think I can feel a sprinkler on my stance.
the WNBA is a unique market, right? It moves a little bit different. You take a bet, a limit play, even if the limit is two dimes on a side, you don't go from 11 and a half to 12. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got to go. Got to go. Because if they bet you the second number, then you go, oh boy, now we have a decision that we really didn't think we got a big decision. Books love decisions. Game time decisions. Only on Sports Grid. Watch out for USA and Canada in four years. Like an eight, like cricket's going to be a sport that's growing. I made my first cricket bet last week or over the weekend. I was getting a team that was leading like 150 to five plus odds. I'm like, I'm up 150 points and I'm getting plus odds. Where do I sign? I love this cricket stuff. What are you kidding me? In game live, prime time only on Sports Grid. Now joins that team in Sacramento with the King, Aaron Fox, DeMontis Sabonis, Devin Carter, who they drafted early, Keegan Murray as well. A Kings team, DRS, that has been a playoff contender. Is it going to equate to a championship? Probably not. That's not the goal. Make your team better every offseason. The Kings definitely got better with that move here, Ben. The early line, only on Sports Grid. He also noted that the only reason he felt it was because uh, he was wearing metal spikes instead mm. of instead of the soft yeah. spikes, which yeah. I, I to, to go on a real tangent, we want to do this later. I found deeply ironic as Sahith Agala stayed to watch him and celebrate his win. And Sahith has been on the show and is on the record as being very anti metal spikes. So I think. So hit the robber need to have some sort of a long form discussion about no we see this is a different deal so <laughs> when you play lynx golf i'm actually all for the metal spikes okay all right yeah firmer ground better grip and if the ground is already firm you're not going to see spike marks you see spike marks on places that the greens are soft uh there you typically go typically lynx golf you're not going to see the spike marks well there you go so learn something new every day that's one thing and also the other benefit to wearing metal spikes and links golf is if you hit it in the long grass and you you stand and take a stance you might find a sprinkler that's going to entitle you to free relief and that is exactly what happens in this situation calls over a rules official he agrees yep you are standing on a sprinkler the drop he gets is a a pretty perfect lie for where he was he ended up in the rough a very different situation than where he'd driven the ball he's got 247 in and he hits a seven iron from that distance and runs it up to six feet, makes that eagle putt, and that shot proves to be the difference. So I, I think I, here's what I want to just kind of explore with you a little bit is I, I am not saying at all this is Bobby Mack's fault for taking the drop. I think if you were a pro and you were not using the rules to your advantage, you are naive and or foolish. So I, I, I think he did the right thing in trying to position himself best to win this tournament. But – how do we feel about this rule and a a when you're, you're playing tournament golf, you hit the ball in a place, you're entitled to relief, but the 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 situation that the, the, the ball is being played from materially changes as, as a result of that drop. What are your feelings on that? Man, if there's a sprinkler head there and it's on my foot, I'm taking a drop. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care how bad the lie is. It's you're entitled to a drop. I think the biggest issue that that rules guys have in whether it's grandstands that a, that block a ball that go 40 yards compared to where it should have gone, I'm much more hmm. on that side of like that's not where the golf ball would have ended up in this situation. Listen, you're you're entitled if you're if you're standing on a sprinkler head and if it's on let's say it was up next to the green and you had a nasty lie and next thing you know you're uh let's say you were a yard away from being in the first fairway cut taking a drop you know you're taking a drop 
in uh, next thing you get your putter out. So it happens all the time. Now, I do feel like if you're, you know, let's say in that same situation that I'm talking about where your ball is greenside in some nasty rough and you're standing on a sprinkler head and then you're able to get the ball onto the fringe or being able to get the putter out, I feel like it should stay in the same grass that it's in. Now, the situation that you're describing in the fescue, I haven't seen the video, but it sounds like he was already in that that area. I don't think you can replicate the lie. Um, maybe you could, but that's just so discretionary, right? Like you, there's no way to be able f- for the guys in the group. Like, yep, that's the exact same lie that you had. So I'm I'm for the free relief, uh, but um. I'm also here for controversy as well. Uh, So if this gives us something to talk about, then fine. Yes. I mean, there's nothing like a good uh, media created outrage that, you know, a bunch of people are yelling about. And it's actually just not that big of a controversy at all. It's just like 12 people that are screaming into the void about it. I I think it's like, why is there a sprinkler head there that that would be the question (laughs) that is that is where my head went first i was like why is it there and why is it so buried and is that a functional sprinkler head and maybe should we look at maybe getting that removed at some point in time because i'm not sure that we're using that uh i I think you make a good point too about you know when, when people complain in any sport about the rules and the way they're written it you gotta you have to take the next step of okay well how would you write them differently and that's where i think we get hung up in this situation is you know, it is completely arbitrary if he has the lie he has and you're saying, well, you can't materially change or improve the lie. It's like, well, then who's going to be the person that goes and takes it away from the sprinkler and then finds another part of the grass to put it into where there's not a material change? You know, it's you really can only write a rule to be as simple as you're standing on a thing that you, you shouldn't have to stand on. You get X amount of club lengths from where you're standing And the method by which we're telling you to replace the ball is to drop it from your knee. I mean, that you really can't write it in any way that makes it so ambiguous that that it's you you can't, you know, interpret it clearly. So I I, I think that's a fair point. But also, I share the same agreement with you of, of, you know, we see some weird stuff around those, the TIO and the grandstands and this and that, where it's there was one a couple of weeks ago on the DP World Tour where they had like a hospitality tent that was literally right up against the green and and i think i saw a guy like airmail it into that you know hospitality area and then just took a drop on the actual green you're like this is first of all terrible course construction but second of all like why why are we doing tournaments in this way shape and form One of the many exciting things about joining Live was was being able to come here and, and play in front of a Spanish crowd, uh, especially on a level of event and level of competition that I hadn't really yet enjoyed. Right, I've uh, been able to play events in Spain. We are in the beautiful Valderrama, uh, which some say is the European Augusta. Uh, it's so special. There's so much history here. There's so much Spanish history here. Well, it has so much history behind. It's only a 50 years old club, but it's so much has happened through the years. I mean, uh, we had the Ryder Cup, we had World Gold Championships, and now we have Lyft. It's very exciting, and really, if there was ever a place to get my first win, I feel like this would be the perfect week. This wind in this golf course is so difficult that it's equally stressful no matter when or where you're playing it. Uh, but it was fun. It's always fun to be back home and be with the home crowd. It's always a joy to have this many people supporting me all day. It's, it's so much fun. course were you playing today uh, i don't know it's brutal I mean, out there it is brutal i don't know it was i just made everything i looked at jerry you have those days i suppose this is one of those days for me so i really should you know i really enjoyed it every time i stood over a putt just felt like i could make it and you don't get days like that too often or certainly i don't so um yeah i relished in it and, and i managed to hit a lot of good shots as well so it was a special day On 
that topic, have you been in a locker room around a tournament where you're watching a competitor or, or someone else who you're playing with or your friend of is watching a competitor who gets a drop like that. And what is the type of reaction you get in that situation? Is it just like, Hey, that's how it goes. Or it's like, is it like, you gotta be kidding me, man. How does he get that drop in that situation? It's like, I wonder how an Adam Scott feels looking back on that. Like, really? That's how I lose a golf tournament. <laughs> you didn't see guys question drops quite as much uh, when, when it comes to sprinkler head, because I think a lot of, a lot of players, you know, there's a benefit of the doubt when it comes to that. It's, you know, they, they trust the, hey, this is the shot you were trying to play. Now, there's times times where guys, you know, bend it a little bit if they're next to a tree. And it's like, oh, you know, my only shot was to play lefty and I'm standing in the cart path. Next thing you know, you take a drop. Now you're hitting righty and have a full shot at the green. So that there's ways in which it's like, ah, is that really the fairest thing ever? No. Um but I think the other big one is is just why like where your ball crosses the water. It's that's such a uh, opinion and what your what your eyes see versus another person and, and the angles that you have. I think you you hear about that maybe every other month about something of of like man that was a dicey drop and, and sometimes our our TV uh, picks up the conversations like the you know the Rory one the Rory. at, at yeah. seven at uh at the players, the players. Was, a, was a popular one and 18 that same day. So uh, Daniel Berger comes to mind um, at 16 at players. I don't know why mm-hmm. all these are at players, but maybe it's just a lot of water, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, it's, I think for the most part, all the guys, uh, they know how the PGA tour rules officials are going to govern uh, and, and just how, and what you can get away with as far as just, drops and for the most part they protect the players um, health and safety when it comes to potentially injuring yourself but I mean sometimes you get lucky which is what you got to do to win and I tell you this all the time when it comes to winning you got to get lucky and Robert McIntyre got lucky but guess what he did too he took advantage of it yeah and and by the way uh McIntyre knows he got lucky uh, there's an extended quote that he gave after the win where he you know said hey it it it, it, it is, is in summary was effectively just that like I, I I couldn't believe it I was stunned I said to my caddy you know I think I'm standing on a sprinkler and then you get a bit of luck and you know he still had to hit the seven iron to six feet you know and make that putt so oh so is this for the YouTube audience the TV audience this is a it's warm a sea- pistachio cookie is that looks like a right? sea salt um cookie wow chocolate phenomenal chip. yeah i'm um, gonna get um, into that here in a bit yeah i'm gonna midnight snack after this margarita and a doubt. cookie though is that that didn't really go together listen man if you listen to our <laughs> thanksgiving draft we had last year margarita goes with anything <laughs> it's a shame that that only like 17 people listen to that because it was probably one of our best episodes <laughs> <laughs> that that was if you have like an hour to kill and nothing else to do with your life go listen to our, our thanksgiving draft or watch it on youtube because it was uh it was it was one of our ex- exactly as smiley says there was and if you, and if you couldn't laughs. follow if you couldn't follow exactly what we were trying to do there we didn't really know either um but we had a great time with it boy did we i can't wait to run that back this year not sure what we're gonna do the wrinkles gonna be this year but that was uh quite enjoyable uh the, the other guy worth talking about, I mean, there are a number of notable names at the top of the leaderboard that as we preview the Open Championship this week, we're going to get to and talk about them in depth. But Ludwig Ober comes into the day leading. Uh, he, I mean, if you look at Ludwig's week, it's so strange. Like he goes 64, 64, 65, and then 73 on Sunday, three over par. Uh, and looking at his strokes gain stats, I mean, it's just – it was just bad across the board. It was, you know, he his his probably his worst metric was was well, worst metric was around the green, lost a shot and a half there. But close after that was uh, it lost a shot and a quarter off the tee, uh, lost one point one shots approach, and then his best statistic was putting, but still was in the negative there, negative zero point six seven strokes gained uh, putting. So just a, a, a strange sort of finish to this tournament for Ludwig a guy that we know has all the talent in the world, a guy who's near the top of the, you know, the, the favorites board for, you know, next week at Troon for the open championship. Uh, so I just wonder what sort of reflections you had on, you know, that result for him, given how much we think of his game and his performances in these sort of situations. Well, I think it's always good to look at how the rest of the field played that day and just what they were relative to par and the fact that only 16 players shot over par of 74 players and of the top 26 guys, only one guy shot over par. And that was 
Ludwig Oberg, another player shot even par, Matteo Manicero. But I, I think you you have to you have to be a little judgy on this round. You know that that's not a good performance for a player who's had a really strong three days, and felt like it was going to be his his tournament to lose. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think I woke up uh, today. Uh, it was I guess these guys were about to tee off and. I just felt like there was no way Ludwig was going to lose today. I just felt like he was the front runner the whole time, uh, played fantastic the whole week. What was going to stop him? And just didn't expect a, a day in which where he just didn't have it. I, I think that that was really surprising that he was not able to uh, give it much more of a fight than he did. Um, I, I don't think you can say that oh he doesn't have, he doesn't know how to win or he doesn't ha- have the clutch gene. Well. That's not true. Um, he's he's won at every level. He's won on the PGA Tour. But this one's going to sting a little bit. I think he's going to be a little frustrated by his play today. And sometimes you just don't have it. But it's on a on a Sunday and a day in which you have a two-shot lead and you're playing as well as you, you are, I, I think surprised that he was in a better rhythm and not able to kind of stay in that same mind frame that he had the first three days. You know, just looking at, at, at this year specifically, you know, I, the, there are four tournaments that I pulled to kind of reference, you know, when he's been in a position to kind of go out and win a, a high leverage tournament. And so obviously we just saw him at the U.S. Open. He was, you know, in solo first after the second round. He shoots 73, 73 on the weekend to finish T12 uh, at the RBC Heritage. He's tied for fourth after the third round, uh, shoots 72 to finish tied for 10th. Uh, at the Masters, this kind of runs counter to the point that we're making right now, is he was fourth after the third round. He was one of the kind of the guys that that rose to the top, you know, outside of Scotty to shoot 69 and finish uh, solo second. I think the 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 moment we remember there is is hitting into the water at 11 and really kind of mm-hmm. being the last guy who had a chance to beat Scotty and, and then falling away. You know, he and Colin Morikawa making that same mistake and falling away, you know, and, and I think both of us agree as well, Scotty still wins maybe it's by two shots instead of four but you know ludwig still uh, you know thought played played really well there to finish second and then of course the at t pro-am where he is second a shot back after the third round and we don't even get the fourth round played because of all the weather that was in the area that weekend so as he beds into the pga tour one thing that struck me today was watching the difference in in pace of play between both ludwig and bob mcintyre and i think that um you know, there is – it seemed like there were moments where he – I think – I don't know if they were put on the clock or warned early on, but whatever the situation was, clearly they were not playing at his preferred pace of play. And if you're in his camp, are you suggesting any sort of adjustment or or just, you know, hey, I know you like to play this way and everyone loves you for it, but maybe let's kind of try to – fit in with the rest of the tour here so that you're, you're taking the time you need to hit these high leverage shots when you're in contention on a Sunday. Do they play uh twosomes or threesomes? I believe it was twosomes today. Okay. Um, you know, just, just double check that. Maybe uh, that there was an issue with maybe would got in some trouble early in the day. Next thing you know, you're put on the clock that always can throw players off, especially when they don't like being on the clock for a guy like Ludwig who's never really on the clock because he's a very quick player like you're talking about but I don't think Robert uh, or Bob as as so many call him uh, would be by any means slow playing anyone Uh, I think Ludwig is a a quick player he wants to play fast he wants to stay in rhythm but you know every day is different I think you you on especially on a Sunday you have to find a way to will yourself well, on days he don't have it and Ludwig didn't have it today so the fact that he wasn't able to kind of just dig a little deeper and just whether it was a putt he had to make or a decision with an iron shot to play it more toward conservatively and uh, maybe he got caught playing too aggressive trying to play catch up and make birdies uh, I wish I could comment more on it as I was working all day I uh, <laughs> wasn't able to get to watch it all but uh, that you, you see that happen uh, happen a lot of times with with guys that are pushing uh, that maybe had uh, woken up of all they're thinking about is, is winning the golf tournament and sometimes they skip some steps and not able to stay present. Uh, but no, I, I, you, you don't ne- you don't need to change routines. And I don't think Ludwig doesn't. To me, he's very instinctual. He's not a guy that yes, he has a routine, but he'll slow it down if he needs to. 
anyone that's been to a sporting event, the atmosphere before a game, I think Game Time Decisions has that same exact atmosphere. This is our arena. This is what we do. There is going to be an energy to game time decisions that you will feel night in and night out. The excitement you get when you, when you lock your bets and when you're figuring out what you want to do, we can zone in on the biggest games each night. I want this to be the place that people come to before the games start so they feel as ready as possible to lock in their cards. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. We're gonna go through every single thing and I've got a great team behind me that's gonna help me get the job done. There is not gonna be a better place, I promise you, than Game Time Decisions to get that new information, react to it, and be able to then bet accordingly. We will have everything at our disposal and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on SportsGrid. It is Canada. You know, Canada is one of those teams that's the darling of, of the tournament right now. They're still 9-1. to one. To win a tournament or even to advance far into a tournament like this, you need a bit of good fortune. And it doesn't matter if you're getting the good fortune that Canada has where they played two matches where they were up a man or you had the good fortune of Argentina, who's one of the best teams in the world, who just got on the good side of the draw. Newswire. Only on SportsGrid. Watch out for USA and Canada in four years. Like in eight, like cricket's going to be a sport that's growing. I made my first cricket bet last week or over the weekend. I was getting a team that was leading like 150 to five plus odds. I'm like, I'm up 150 points and I'm getting plus odds. Where do I sign? I love this cricket stuff. What are you kidding me? In game live, prime time only on Sports Grid. You know, listen, we, we can't pick winners every single week. Might as we try. Uh, you finished, you did a lot better than I did with Tom Kim uh, to my Minwoo Lee pick. Minwoo yeah. Lee started top 15. Hot. Yeah, you had a little uh, tie for 15. Uh, Minwoo Lee, I believe, was 73rd. Can not, we talk not, about not, Tom, though, what he did? <laughs> yeah, you, you scared, not really me, you scared, just scared me for the show when you said, I woke up to a text one morning saying, and I thought Tom Kim was not registered for the tournament. <laughs> Well, he didn't register for the tournament, and typically he would have had to flown home, but I guess there was a sponsor exemption still available, and they gave it to Tom. So he could have very easily flown over to Scotland, realized he didn't sign up, and then had to have flown home. So I'm blaming Tom Kim not winning this week in those five shots. That had to be like a five-shot penalty in his brain, and that's I think that ended up being the difference. Actually, six shots. He shot 12 under. Yeah. I think that's good for six. I, I, I wonder, I, I, I wish I'd seen more of him play this week with the different, you know, the time of the tournament. Like, did he have to slap the sponsor's logo on? Do you have additional sponsor <laughs> committee? Like, what was the nature of that, of that exemption? You got to wonder what happened there behind the scenes. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But, but uh, my, my boy, Aaron Rye, just can't stop, won't stop shooting six under par every round. How about Aaron Rye? So our, our our two guys amongst the ones we liked, we I I had the gala, you had Rye, both finished tied for fourth. Aaron Rye, here here's what I want to just note here because I was looking through his stats, and you know in the past his weakness has been putting. Right, uh, this week in his second round on Friday gained almost three strokes putting, and then on Sunday when he goes out and shoots, I think he shot a sixty, he shot a sixty three on Sunday. Uh, he gained 3.36 strokes uh, putting in, in that Sunday round and qualifies for the Open Championship in the process. So, I, you know, for me, it's like, OK, everything's starting to come together for him. We And we've obviously seen it in the past month with some of these tournaments. But just the and I think the putting thing is especially interesting because we have changed surfaces so much in this past month. Bermuda at Pinehurst. Then you go to the Bent Poe mix at Travelers and Rocket Mortgage. Then you go to Bent at John Deere. Now you're here, you know, putting on Red Fescue, and, and it'll be the same next week at the Open. So to see him putting like this on this grass makes me think, he, you know, now he's in. He can play pretty well at Trim. Bro, he's a striper. Uh, and since making the change and going to see John Graham up in uh, Rochester, teaches a lot of guys out on tour. He is his improvement in that part of his game has been the reason for the big jump. I mean, you you kind of reference it and how good the putting was at the Scottish Open, but man, he had some 
unbelievable putting days uh, at the John Deere and the Rocket Mortgage, just days that are just you, you can't miss. So obviously whatever he's doing it, I remember his routine. He was like taking his arm off, off of the club and like putting it on his chest. And maybe there's something to either square his shoulders or maybe he's trying to feel his shoulders, move the putter back. And that's kind of the reference point in that. But my boy is all the way up in the top 50 in the world. And he ain't won yet. So if that tells you what type of golf he's played, he's 45th in the world. So love to see it. Uh, maybe Aaron Rye, maybe he's the, like if, if there's a guy that's going to randomly win the open championship chip next week that nobody's talking about winning dude Aaron Rye yeah I mean Englishman you know should be a little bit of that home cooking uh you know he's a guy that <laughs> a little uh, home cooking we can't we can't overlook the home cookers now uh, the home cookers <laughs> is is it's rapidly shooting up the data gut uh model it, it's being factored in i'm i'm tweaking my percentages of the data gut and, and except, home cooking except is now fitzy high. he doesn't like links golf so we <laughs> we gotta remove him from <laughs> From the his, data yet. His 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 uh, home cooking variable I've, I've had to turn down. It's a, it's a specific toggle I've made for him. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, you got it's, it's interesting. It's like I wonder, has he played too much golf? You know, like in this in this last stretch, like as he's played, I think, darn near every week. And is, is this a guy who's like going to be just rolling in on fumes at the Open <laughs> Championship? I mean, I, I, I don't how know. About it, but, how about it, man? He's played so like there's somebody that always plays really well during the summer. Aaron Rye, it's, it's been him this year he wasn't in the open championships like you said so to go all the way over to scotland you know he probably didn't have to play uh decides you know what i'm playing good enough let me go play the scottish i'll go try to play my way into the open championship and uh, i've watched him play plenty this year it just he's got it on a string he drives it incredibly straight and uh he's built for an open championship those two gloves that he's that he wears on both hands that is that is a guy that is built for major championship open championship golf i should say yes it's like uh i wonder if he has i wonder if he has a separate pair of gloves that they're the rain gloves like are the rain gloves the primary gloves and he has a different set of rain gloves these are all things that we might find out this week at true if we get yeah. a little bit of precipitation have Listen, you looked if, at the forecast by the way uh i think it's raining Ooh. um okay. i think it's raining which fits for my boy and ray rain gloves Rain gloves, big rain gloves week for for the rag guy and uh, and his irons. You know he's got the covers on on the heads, so that's he's another good. Point. So it, this guy, I'm yeah. telling you, yeah, really heating up on Aaron Rye. Am I, of course. Um, am I just selling you like this is going to be the week he wins? Yeah, you, you're starting to. It's a real shame he didn't do it when I picked him in one and done, and he came <laughs> you know woefully close. That's uh, I see all these these guys now through the lens of one and done. So you're probably going to sneak in a little air. You, you know what? I should say this: you deserve to win with Aaron Rye, even might, on the train. I might pick him. I might pick him. You deserve to win with Aaron Rye. So wouldn't that be a, a Cinderella story? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, so I, I I think I mean that's the guy that's putted well. Um, JT, I, I, you know, I wanted to briefly touch on, he, he opened up with that 62 and gained 3.42 strokes, uh, putting with that new Scotty Cameron. Cause we, we'd seen him change. He had the old Scotty that was a mallet and then he'd gone to that blade that was a replica of what Gordon Sargent was using. And now he's got this new, um, I, I don't know if it's a prototype or it's just like the newest model of, of like the, the Scotty Phantom or something like that looked really, really good. The Friday through Sunday, not so good, but golly like just watching on thursday i was like "Ooh, jt might be back like we might be in we're back territory and you know we'll get there we'll get there no it's, it's good to see a, a hot putting around i think once it's one statistic that just popped out uh it was a justin ray tweet probably i'm not sure if it was or not but he made a 42 foot putt that first round and it was the longest uh putt he has made since 2022 at 42 feet like he hadn't made wow. anything outside of 40 feet which you think he'd run one in at some point over a year and a half so that just kind of tells you kind of how it's been for jt which is a guy that normally wears out the middle of the greens and if he's not getting anything to to go from that range like once a tournament you know you're you don't pick up that that extra shot or just that extra momentum putt that that you know can propel you to some some more uh, golf like it in the, in the coming holes so you're constantly just trying not to three putt that's uh you gotta hit it pretty dang close
one of the many exciting things about joining Live was was being able to come here and, and play in front of a Spanish crowd, uh, especially on a level of event and level of competition that I hadn't really yet enjoyed. Right, I've uh, been able to play events in Spain. We are in the beautiful Valderrama, uh, which some say is the European Augusta. Uh, it's so special. There's so much history here. There's so much Spanish history here. Well, it has so much history behind. It's only a 50 years old club, but it's so much has happened through the years. I mean, uh, we had the Ryder Cup, we had World Gold Championships, and now we have Liv. It's very exciting, and really, if there was ever a place to get my first win, I feel like this would be the perfect week. This golf course is so difficult that it's equally stressful no matter when or where you're playing it. Uh, but it was fun. It's always fun to be back home and be with, with the home crowd. It's always a joy to have this many people supporting me all day. It's, it's so much fun. course were you playing today? Uh, I don't know. It's brutal I mean, out there. It is brutal. I don't know. It was, I just made everything I looked at, Jerry. You have those days. I suppose this is one of those days for me, so I really shouldn't, you know, I really enjoyed it. Every time I stood over a putt, just felt like I could make it, and you don't get days like that too often, or certainly I don't, so um, yeah, I relished in it, and, and I managed to hit a lot of good shots as well, so it was a special day. Now's as good a time as ever to kind of turn it over to the other professional tour uh, where we will be seeing some of these guys in the field this next week at the Open uh, live at Valderrama. And if you're a Spanish sporting fan, congrats. You had a day on Sunday because you started the day with uh, a win for Carlitos Alcaraz at Wimbledon in straight sets over Novak Djokovic. Uh, and then, you know, you waited maybe a couple hours and you watched Spain defeat England in the Euro final. Uh, and then, uh, of course, maybe arguably the most important event of the day, Sergio Garcia and the Fireballs win the individual and team awards at Live Valderrama. So lots of lots of Spanish triumphing. And boy, I mean, Sergio looked like a Spanish flag, as did the rest of his team. But we are. <laughs> God bless him. I, I like the Fireballs and the Ironheads are in a like worst uniform off. And I don't know who's winning right now. No, they're I'll both the doing great. Got to throw the Legion in there, too. You don't like the Legion uniforms. I mean, the Legion uniforms aren't great, but they're also not like. I oh, mean, you've seen the I mean, Iron Man shirts. I don't like the logo. I don't like the Legion okay. logo. So I don't know. I, I don't like it either, though. I don't like the hot pink and black. I, I don't know. That ain't for me. The Iron Heads uniforms are are so bad they're almost good. Like they look like uh, <laughs> it's like, like the a, Raiders, isn't it? In like black and gray. No, they off? have well, they have like these weird, like these green stripe. Like it looks like a Ooh, like a no. second division Italian soccer team. It's amazing. Uh, I don't know. I don't know who makes them or, or you know where they get them from. But yeah, I mean those. But yeah, but the the Ronald McDonald look. It's it's a look. It's definitely it's definitely <laughs> it's, a look. And shout out to anybody that parlayed all of the Spanish <laughs> teams winning. And if you happen to have the prop bet of Abraham answer, throwing his wedge into the woods, oh my what a ticket Lord. you cash with Alcaraz Euro final Sergio, the fireballs and answer answers wedge still in the air. <laughs> I, I had, I had that one as sort of a kicker to the segment, but you noted it. So let's just chat about this. I mean, I'm a retired member of the helicopter gang L used to love a good club toss, but I've, I've been, told by people love me it needs to stop and so I'm, I'm doing my best but i just i want to know the shot cut off i want to know where it landed because to me, to me the, 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 the key to a good club toss is you have like a split second after you've hit a terrible shot to determine where can i throw this club to where it's not going to damage my club head or mm -hmm. my shaft and you then can't, it, you can't be vertical it's got to be horizontal it's a horizontal. It's it's a it's like a frisbee motion, 
And then you got to commit to the release. You, know, you can't mm-hmm. try to steer it in there. You just got to trust it and just let that thing go and just trust that it's going to land. And I've had some close calls. I threw a two iron into a creek bed one time, miraculously missed all the rocks in there. It was, you know, no words for the wear. But um, I, I just want to know. I want to know if Abe was able to pick a good target right after you stubbed that chip shot and, and land that wedge in there nice. Or if we're looking at a, at a replacement wedge. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he found that man. <laughs> you, think Maybe. He just, you think he just left it? Well, I think it's so far in there. I don't think it was a situation where you're going to find it. But oh, I'm not, oh, you, I'm, oh, you think I, he threw it into like a hazard? I didn't see on the side of the thing. I just, I mean, Valderrama just doesn't seem like a place when you throw it in into the woods that you're going to go find it. Mm. This is the part of the episode where Smiley's just received his gate announcement. So I'm not sure where we were. In, and in I finished that. my cookie. <laughs> and you finish your cookie. So let's finish your cookie now. Uh, and yeah, mm. look, there, there, we had a few other things on our docket that we were going to get to. But here's here's the great thing about that is, is I had some some numbers and stat that Sean had passed on on John Rom, And we get to talk about that as part of our open championship preview, because as we've discussed previously on the show, this is a big one for Rom, final major of the year chance to make a statement. So we'll get to that at that point. Um, and we got a lot of fun stuff coming up this week. We've got an open championship preview. We're going to discuss Troon, some historical facts and figures uh, from previous opens played here. We have, of course, our one and done picks. We're going to have a huge bounce back week, get a little playoff yeah, and live stream. You're going to have a bounce back week. I actually had a pretty decent week. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm speaking for myself here, but you know, I'm also I'm coming off a win, so I have a little bit of you know a little bit of leeway there. Uh, so and Smiley, of course, on site. And Troon, uh, 7.4 on the cookie, 7.4 for the cookie. So look, that's good. We went up. We went mm-hmm. from 6.2 to 7.4. Margarita sandwich, a nine. Ma- that's <laughs> look, it looked and like I a could, nine. I could it looked like a 9.5. Nine <laughs> this was fantastic. <laughs> Some tells me they might serve you a few of those on the flight over to Heathrow. So uh, I'm not like a, I'm not a plain alcohol drinker. Yeah. Um, it's like not my thing. I, I'm actually only drink. It's the only time I ever drink soda on a plane. It's I drink, I drink Sprite every flight. Okay. And I never drink soda anywhere else. It's just the weirdest thing. Well, I mean, I'm sure you're going to have pl- you, you got plenty of time to go have some Sprites and margaritas on the way over there. And the next time we see you, we're going to be talking to you to preview the Open Championship. So we're looking forward to that. And then, of course, as we do always for all these majors, we're going to have daily journals recapping all the action from Troon. So that's what you got to look forward to this week. We appreciate you watching and listening. And we'll be not back here. I'll be here. Smiley will be over there. We'll talk to you soon.